The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, the July Expert Webinar Series for a uh, Golden Shovel Agency. Uh, my name is Aaron Brassois. I'm CEO of Golden Shovel, and I'm excited to have an opportunity to share with you today a presentation called Somewhere Between Site Selection and Storytelling. And before we get started, just a couple things. Feel free to type in questions over on the right side. Uh, there's in the uh, control panel. And at the end of the presentation, be happy to take any questions. And then um, also this uh, presentation will be recorded. So there'll be a copy of it available on the Golden Shovel Agency website afterwards, as well as slides uh, will be made available. So with nothing more to do, let's get going. All right, somewhere between site selection and storytelling. Well, I'd like to get started by talking a little bit about why storytelling and uh, how storytelling ended up getting between the, the site selection uh, process and the marketing that economic developers do today. And it all begins because Humans communicate through stories. And we need to take a little look back at what's happened from the past to explain how we got here today. And first of all, storytelling itself was the original marketing. Uh, long before there was even printed publications, uh, all of the, the main messaging and, and influential uh, decisions were made usually based off stories. And up until today, we've had a lots of different types of traditional advertising um, of all sorts of sorts, whether it's going to be uh, billboards, uh, whether we have advertising by print publications, there's been radio ads. Uh, this has been the main area of focus uh, all the way up through the 90s. And it was only in the 2000s where, where web advertising started to become really prevalent. And if you take into consideration Moore's law, in the next 10 years, technology is going to advance a thousand times. And if you think back to 2008, technology has advanced a thousand times since then already. And one of the banes of uh, traditional media and traditional marketing is it just can't keep up with the, the, the change in rate of the technology. Um, it no longer is it capable of, of tracking um, before you would put an ad out on the radio, you could put an ad up on a billboard, you could put an ad up onto a, uh, a print publication, and you'd have a general idea of how many listeners there might be or drivers that would go by or viewers that were reading the publication. But you never really knew what impact your ad was having unless somebody contacted you directly and said they saw it. So it was kind of like throwing spaghetti at the fridge and seeing what sticks. But fortunately, uh, we have the internet. Um, unfortunately, the internet started off by just barraging us with, in essence, digital versions of traditional advertising. Um, that started right away out of the gate in 1996, when they first started coming out with uh, websites, how you advertise on it. There were the banner ads. And the banner ads got bigger. You guys have seen pop-up ads that pop up in front of your content. Um, every single possible way to get you to click on something or to buy something. And it just got a little bit overwhelming. Although it was great that you could track them, you could see how many people clicked on the ad. It was had gotten to a point where this kind of advertising wasn't just uncomfortable for the users, but it became a, an anti-ad. Uh, people didn't want to work with the brands that were uh, interrupting their attempt to, to read the news or to uh, work on a website. And in Forbes 
uh, this article I found recently, this is from just the end of 2017, it says, challenges for a modern brand, digital marketing experts estimate that most Americans are exposed to around 4,000 to 10,000 ads each day. At some point, we start a screening process for what we engage with and start ignoring brands and advertising messages. And um, that's exactly what happened. And what that's led to is a much more powerful form of marketing. And it's also the reason why word of mouth becomes so powerful, because we trust our friends, family, and peers to help us filter the messaging and determine what's real. It's uh, begun the rise of social media, where we can share with each other about uh, what products and services that we are using and like. Um, it's why word of mouth becomes the number one form of influential marketing. But if you think about word of mouth and you think back about how long ago it began, the story is the content of word of mouth marketing. What you're sharing when you're sharing with somebody else is in the context of stories, either an experience you've had, an experience you heard somebody else had, or in the case of a, a well-written story, it might be a story that you had heard or read, which is what we're going to be focusing on today. So think of it as we create these stories, and we focus on how they influence economic development, that this is the content that you're hoping people will pass around in their word of mouth discussions. And some other things are different too uh, than before. Now, 10 years ago, Economic development websites were different. They were very focused on site selectors. They were very focused on business attraction. They were not uh, that interested in um, having to show a lot of quality of life information. We did not have to have a lot of visuals. It was in no way competition with a tourism site. Uh, also, the site selectors' needs were different too. Uh, they did not care to search through your website. Um, all they were looking for was data. And oftentimes they have their own systems and their own algorithms and their own processes and softwares that they're using internally. And so they were looking for data that they could easily integrate into those systems. They were looking for Excel spreadsheets, uh, uh, data that they could quickly move from the website into their system so that they could determine which communities were not gonna make the list uh, sooner than later. Um, today, data is still very very important and having accurate data is required just to really play the game um, the types of data that site selectors are looking for from a website has changed a little bit mainly because they have access to a lot more data than they had before so instead of looking for say demographic data which they can now get for the entire country they're going to be more interested in uh, very specific workforce data leading employers uh, skill sets of the current workforce, the types of programs that you're going to find inside, uh, say, the universities and uh, uh, other types of incentive programs that might be available through the community. This is the type of data that's a little trickier for them to get and still plays a role uh, today. But beyond site selectors, there's a lot of different types of audiences that are, are making decisions around site selection. Um, it's not always going to be a corporate site selector or a contracted site selector. In some cases, it's going to be a business owner themselves who now has access to these tools and has access to more information. Um, and so they can uh, uh, be able to go in there and they can, can do their own research and determine uh, what they're, whether or not it's a good fit for their company. And the difference is that unlike the site selectors, the business owners are gonna be looking at it as a place that they might live. They're gonna be considering um, where their spouses will be working or what they'll be doing when they're there, or where their children are going to be going to school, what the neighborhoods are going to be like that they'll be living in. All of that will play a role in uh, the decision-making process. And beyond that, we also have audiences like entrepreneurs and the economic development websites now just as much have to cater to workforce and attracting talent, uh, which certainly is a different audience than we were at all focused on 10 years ago. Now, at Golden Shovel, we've heard a lot of different stories. Right now, we're working with roughly 160 communities. We're in 26 some states in Canada. And with all of these different groups, we've heard different types of stories. And I'm 
here to say that no matter if you're an urban community or a rural community, you have stories there that are going to be valuable for your economic development marketing. It's about, it's not about um, the number of stories, but it's about taking the stories that you have and crafting them into messages that support your brand. So that's what we'll be talking about today and be sharing some case studies and examples of different types of stories uh, that we've seen uh, through our own work and uh, work of others around the industry. So let's get started. And we'll start with creating a success story. Crafting a success story. So the first thing we're looking at before crafting a story is determining who the story is gonna be for. Now we just started talking about some of these audiences. Um, and since this particular presentation is gonna be, is focused on site selection, I'm gonna focus on the business attractions side of this, although there'll be some examples and twists that tie in with some of the other areas, whether it be workforce and uh, entrepreneurs, et cetera. But you're determining that the story might be for site selectors themselves. Uh, you might make a story specifically for the business owners or, or stories that uh, support businesses that are there. Uh, entrepreneurs, uh, certainly, whether it's entrepreneurs that are in or aspiring already in your community that are ready to grow, or entrepreneurs uh, outside of the community that might be interested in moving in and starting. And then also uh, target industries. So in some cases, you're looking to influence an industry to make your, do an awareness campaign or an awareness story to make sure that your community is on the map uh, for the industry looking at uh, where it's best to do business. I want to focus in on a certain type of story. And this is a success story. Um, the thing with the success stories is that they are memorable and they're particularly aspirational to the people that you're trying to target. So once we've decided, let's just determine we're going to focus in on uh, uh, attracting a, a business owner, that the story has to start with somebody, a character or a hero, somebody thriving in your community. Now, this is a process, I'm a credit to storybrand.com. If you have a chance, you should check out StoryBrand. It's a fascinating uh, formula for, for brand story creation. And uh, it's one of the ones we use for in support of our success stories. Now the character and hero in your story, let's be clear, is not you. The character is gonna be um, the, the aspirational person that's already thriving in your community that you want to use to influence others that are going to read the story. So um, perhaps it's the CEO of a business that's doing really well in your community or that has been growing. Uh, that could be the, the character. Um, in a workforce attraction case, it might be a particular talent that's been moved into the community and is uh, really thriving. It gives a great example for other people that might have been in the same situation to uh, see how they could get there also. And then what's important is that there's a problem. That character has to have a problem. And businesses have all sorts of problems. Uh, there's always a, a problem in, inside a story to uh, uh, find. And you might be wondering why am I spending so much time looking for these problems when I'm trying to tell a success story. And the reason is because it makes for a good story. Uh, without a good problem, there isn't really a good story to be told. Uh, nobody wants to hear a story about somebody went to the store and then they made it to the store and they bought what they wanted and they came home and that's the end of the story and it's forgotten by the time it's told. But when there's a really big problem, then there's something to be considered, there's something at stake. And with businesses, they have all sorts of different types of problems. In some cases, um, they don't have enough of a certain type of talent. And so they're moving to your community because you've got that as a solution. Uh, perhaps they're taking advantage of a program that if they did not move to your community, uh, they would not get the support from the community they were in. Um, some cases, the problem might be just about land or about um, enough resources. Maybe they don't have enough water or they don't have enough uh, uh, energy in the community that they were in. So we've got to be able to determine the problem. And you can dig this out. Uh, while interviewing uh, the, the aspirational uh, heroes of your stories. And from there, the hero 
meets a guide. Now, in most cases, the guide is going to be the economic development professional. And the guide's going to say, all right, here's a plan. I recognize your problem. You don't have enough of this resource. Um, you need more welders. Uh, whatever the problem might be, the guide has some ideas on how to solve it and comes, to the, comes into the picture and then gives them a plan. Says, tell you what, if you come to our community, we have these programs in place at the university that are going to generate enough welders for you. Also, we're going to be able to give you this program and these particular incentives to support you as we get your welders trained up. And we can offer this and this, and here's our great workforce, and give them a plan that they can consider that's going to ultimately solve the problem that they're struggling with. And that plan calls them into action in some way. So the plan is out there and they are now ready and motivated. They, they see the solution and they decide they're gonna make that happen and they go for it. And it's important, especially back when the problem is first presented, the risks at stake. Because there's either got to be great success or great failure at the end. And the higher the stakes, the better the story and the more memorable it becomes. And on the success side, it could be a successful move to a great community that it's now engaged with, uh, with, um, you know, it might have expanded the community, perhaps it had um, become great partners with the, the local uh, chambers and other entities, and uh, ultimately did a great job. And the, on the failure side, uh, perhaps it was, the business would close or the community would fail if they didn't solve their problem. Now, we're focusing on success stories. So despite the fact that success and failure is at stake, the success is how it'll result in the end. I'd like to give you uh, one example of a story that uh, last year was the number one success story that was uh, presented through LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn does a lot of, uh, uh, has a great medium, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later for getting content out to very specific people, but the state of Michigan, uh, the Michigan Economic Development Corporation put together a campaign to try to attract Bay Area professionals to the state of Michigan to take on tech jobs. And so they put together some success stories of people thriving in their region. And this particular story went something like this. There was a guy living in the Bay Area. Um, it was very expensive. He was working in the tech. His quality of life really wasn't all that much better, even though he was getting paid more and found it to be expensive and his house was pretty small. He gets invited to his buddy's wedding out in Michigan. He travels to Michigan to the wedding and wow, is he impressed with the size of his buddy's house, with how much land he has, has a great time. Turns out there's mountain biking all over the place and he's an avid mountain biker and gets to do his favorite recreation activity right outside the back steps of his friend's house. And then, to make it even better, his buddy's got some great tech jobs that he's been working at and recommends some to him and he ends up moving out there and living the dream. That story was shared more, liked more, passed around more, and got more uh, social equity than um, any other story for the entire year. And it gives you an idea of how these are written, where there's the person, the hero, there's the problem, there's the guide, in which case this was his buddy. And it was in the plan on how to get a tech job and a bigger house and more space and live out in Michigan, and he succeeds. And so as we talk about how we're going to craft the success stories, I also got to remember that a story isn't just written. Uh, storytelling can be very visual, too. And there are different types of stories. Not all storytelling is necessarily um, going to be just a success story about a specific person. It could be a, a accumulation of a variety of things about the community that puts together a, a different picture. Here's some examples of visual storytelling just using graphics on the home page of the site. This is the Good Life, Region 5 of Minnesota. The Good Life in every season, you can see that uh, the person's enjoying uh, the outdoor recreation. This is, was a workforce attraction related site. 
The Utah Valley Economic Development Partnership has, there's a new economic dynasty. Forbes ranked Utah number one business five out of the last six years. And you can see uh, the mountains that are designed right into the site and uh, the beauty of the area uh, being reflected as part of their story. Uh, Greater Gallup, New Mexico, I think this is just a gorgeous site. You can see how this one photo with the energizing the workforce uh, just gives a sense of this, the, what's going on in the region. It's beautiful and uh, ties in with the story of Gallup. And then beyond that, there's the ability to use data to tell a story. And data is still just as important as it ever was, just like we were said in the beginning. I mean, site selectors are still looking for this data and also uh, the other site selection audience as well as business owners, uh, they're going to use this data because it's now available online. The tools are more powerful than ever for them to come to their own conclusions and do their own analysis. And one good example of this is um, one of the groups that we work with closely and partner with is uh, GIS Planning. Uh, they're out of San Francisco and they've made uh, both a Zoom prospector tool for locating sites as well as a series of intelligence components that offer some interactive options inside their, their tools. And so one way to tell stories is using interactive maps. And in this case, what we're looking at is Clark County, Ohio. Uh, this, is right, this is built into the Greater Springfield website. And you see a heat map where just the colors of the map can tell a story about, uh, in this case, the, the population and, and where people are living in the community. Um, this type of data doesn't necessarily have to tell a story on its own. It can also be incorporated into success stories um, that are written. Um, another way to tell a story using visuals is for identifying validating industry clusters. Uh, this particular page is from One East Kentucky and it's part of their uh, microsite for industry clusters. Kentucky's top export is aerospace. And you can see all the different dots that are on the map and those are all locating different aerospace companies that are within uh, Eastern Kentucky. And also this is a screenshot from uh, the Economic Development Group in Pasadena, Texas. Uh, this was a site just recently launched and a GS Planning's tool is built into this where you can see the types of businesses that are all around a specific site. Uh, so that helps tell a story or validate why uh, somebody might wanna uh, move their business into this particular facility. Another way to tell stories really visually is by using infographics. And these have become more and more popular uh, for a variety of reasons. So one is the nature of the web and uh, just the ability to take in information from the web, having strong visuals to communicate a message is um, quicker and easier for people to, to read. It's easier for them to pass around. Um, when you have a solid infographic, uh, people will tend to keep them and uh, uh, keep them on hand or keep them inside a folder so when a, a site selector will hold on to an infographic longer than say a large scale brochure that you might provide to them. And especially if the infographic carries a case for a specific target industry or some other um, specific point that you're trying to make about the community. Uh, this one, this is out of the Pasadena, Texas um, piece. This is an, in, an interactive infographic. This is part of the intelligence components. And there's different, uh, a whole variety of different types of data you can click on up at the top. In this case, this we're on the business and jobs, and it's talking about uh, that there's 10,039 jobs over 713 establishments. And what's really neat as you go down into these infographics is they're interactive. So you can adjust dates, um, numbers of people. You can adjust all of these things so that uh, people can uh, kind of look back historically and set up the infographic to exactly what they're trying, the information they're trying to get. Here's another example of an infographic that carried a lot of information and is used by the Mid-America Economic Development Council. Um, in this situation, uh, we were able to uh, make a, it's pretty long, it's about, uh, let's say 15, 16 inches long, it's set, set up as a PDF, so it's on the their website. Uh, but it also made for a nice printout or a nice handout for use at the conferences and for 
any of the communities or states that are within the Mid-America region, that makes a strong case for why Mid-America um, is a place of strength in the U.S. economy. And that's another example of an infographic. And because of the nature of them, once again, they're easy to keep. And if they're visually appealing, they're easy to share, which is a nice way to share a story. And I'd be amiss to leave out video. So video is absolutely one of the strongest and most powerful ways to share a story, mainly because beyond the story itself, you get the, um, the visual component, you have the audio component, and due to the fact that we're on a go to meeting today, I'm not going to share, I'm not going to play this particular video. I don't think it would play through very well, um, but I'll let you know where you can see them at the, they're at the Greater Yankton Living website. And they have a whole host of videos, and I'll talk a little bit more about that website and how they portray them. But in this case, it's a entrepreneur that's sharing about why it's great to do business in Yankton, South Dakota, and um, what they like about it. And it's very authentic feeling when they speak and they can share uh, uh, some of the things about why they chose a rural community to start their company versus an urban community. So at this point, we now determined you know, why the stories are important and how to make a story in different ways we can uh, get that story out. But now it's time to market the story. You want to get it out to as many people as you can. So what is the process for that? And, you know, in some ways, it starts the same way as a traditional uh, traditional marketing would. It's good to have a press release about your story, um, certainly for any kind of current success stories that are coming out. Um, this particular one was for Brady Industries, which was a, a massive win up in Northeast Kentucky. Uh, uh, but this goes out to um, all your, your standard news sources. You want to get it on other people's websites. It's what you would call uh, earned media, where a story is good enough that the press wants to pick it up and place it inside their publications. Uh, industry trade magazines will cover these. Um, even things like site selection magazine and some of these other uh, uh, economic development related ones would love to cover these types of success stories because they have important lessons and are good stories for their audiences. Another thing that we've done in the while working with the Wyoming Economic Development Association was compile success stories across the whole state. So we wrote stories for each of the different counties and some of the major areas and regions and those stories um, were done as a project for the association, but then they were compiled into an annual, um, and as well like an annual report of success stories for the past year. And all of these stories then were able to be used by the individual counties for their own promotional purposes uh, with the interest of, of getting more exposure for them. And beyond making it into a PDF and printing it out as a print piece, they also were able to put it onto their, uh, their websites. And so let me touch on websites because this is where the home is for all of your success stories. Um, these stories that you're going to write need to be placed on the web. This is the uh, first impression that most groups are going to get about your community if they haven't uh, visited yet. And it's where all of your other supporting information is going to be uh, present. So here's the Wyoming Economic Development Association's success stories. They chose to put them out on a map scatter them around the state so people could see uh, visually which success stories might be in their area. And then down below, you can go to the individual stories. So not only were they able to make a nice print piece, but they were able to organize them all onto here. Another one, we just talked about Yankton, South Dakota. Um, if you go to the Yankton, the Grow, uh, go to the Yankton, South Dakota's uh, workforce attraction site, you'll find they took all of their stories, and this is just as easy to do with business attraction, but compiling them all onto the website and being able to put them um, in a nice visual way where people can click on the different graphics. And when they do, they might uh, see the video that was made. If there's a video available, in some cases, it's going to just be an interview where it's written. There certainly can be photos. Um, all of the visual components that support the story can still be put onto the website. And even if we use these same stories as the outreach component for marketing and getting it out there, 
um, we still need to have them back on the site in a compiled fashion so people can go back and find additional stories to support the, the same theme. In some cases, if you really have a specific audience, you might want to consider building out a microsite for that specific audience. And what I mean by microsite is not a small site, but instead a smaller audience. And so in this case, uh, the Greater Irvine Chamber made a microsite for global business resources, knowing that the people that would go to this site are going to be foreign. Um, they're going to be international looking in. It's going to be a little bit different than say other uh, stakeholders or workforce attraction related messaging that might go to their main site, they wanted to set up something separate. And so the stories that they can put onto the global business resource site would be related to uh, foreign companies that had successfully moved into the region, as well as all of the other information that's on the microsite supports that. Now we've seen this for target industries, um, like in the aerospace industry, we've seen this done for specific business parks when those are being marketed. Um, a variety of different ways to use uh, microsites, but it has to do with focusing in on that key audience. And then, of course, when it comes to getting the word out, there's nothing stronger than right now than social media for all of the reasons we started with about word of mouth, um, your your peer network. Your friends and family are going to be more valuable in decision making uh, than ever because of just the barrage of advertisements that we're faced with. Uh, what we're looking at right here is actually a LinkedIn Pulse article. This is one I had posted a while back. And LinkedIn offered the Pulse channel as a, a type of blog structure that can be uh, promoted directly into their network of 500 million professionals. Um, it's certainly in our mind that one of the strongest and best uh, uh, tools that's available, particularly for business attraction and for speaking directly to business professionals and site selection professionals. Um, along with uh, LinkedIn, uh, we found Facebook plays a strong role when it comes to um, awareness, uh, particularly uh, in economic development organizations programs or awareness of when a company moves into a region. And I'll touch on that a little bit in a case study that we did. One of the reasons we really focus in on LinkedIn is because they've got a very high percentage of demographics that fit into the likely business decision makers. Um, of the 500 million people, there's a pretty good swath. There's about 29% of online adults. This is from the end of 2016, so this is about a year, year and a half old, so it's even higher now. Uh, but people from 30 all the way to 65 up are, are using it pretty heavily. Those tend to be business decision makers or people that are gonna be involved with a site selection process. 77% um, or higher have college degrees that tend to be people involved with business decision making. Um, also, a wide percentage of the people active on LinkedIn are making $75,000 or plus, which also speaks to a C-suite professional or people that will be involved with the influencing site location. And I also noted on the bottom arrow that there's a little lower percentage participation from rural regions on LinkedIn. And um, in, in my mind, I believe that is a um, an opportunity for rural communities to take advantage of and to be able to get uh, get the word out. So let's take a look at a case study that we did. This is a one for One East Kentucky. Uh, and we'll talk about the story and how we pushed it through to get out the word the story to the business professionals. Now, One East Kentucky was in probably one of the worst spots in the country as far as economic development is concerned. When we uh, contacted the, uh, working, we were working with uh, Chuck Sexton over there and I was talking to him about what are your major employers? What are the big anchor companies that we can interview? Well, the ones that are thriving in Eastern Kentucky that we can use as our stories, as our success stories that we're gonna market out there. And uh, he shared that there weren't any, there are no companies of that nature there right now. And that's why it's so much work, but they need to find some new ones. And they really wanted to focus on aerospace. 
And there were no aerospace companies that were in the region. And even though they were in the middle of a large aerospace cluster, um, they finally got a big win when Brady Industries, which was the uh, uh, article I pulled up a little earlier, moved their uh, aircraft aluminum plant up into Northeast Kentucky. It was a massive win, created a thousand jobs, um, 1.2 or $1.3 billion of investment. And finally we had something we could really anchor on. And so we put together, uh, just this came out just within a month of when the Brady Industries announcement came out last September, seven reasons why aerospace companies are considering Eastern Kentucky. And we took seven different uh, main pieces, whether it's the programs or the um, story about why Brady Industries was picking it out, um, some of it about all the logistics, why it was validated as an aerospace cluster, and put it together into a Pulse article. Uh, so this is using the LinkedIn Pulse system. And we posted it both through the One East Kentucky site that went through Ch uh, Chuck Sexton's site. And so he was able to uh, put these announcements. We first did the Brady Industries announcement right when it came out, which was to great fanfare. And then with the seven reasons why aerospace companies are considering Eastern Kentucky, we not only posted it on the site, we, all of which you can do for free organically, which connects you directly to their networks, but we also decided to run a sponsored campaign to get this story in front of business decision makers in the aerospace industry. And so we worked with a group called Related out of Toronto, and they helped us determine where the aerospace companies are across the United States and Canada. Um, this helped us with determining where we wanted to focus our messaging. So we didn't have to just send it to anybody all across the country, we wanted to send it into specific states. Some of the influences on that were areas where there was particularly more foreign investment going into the aerospace region. Also um, areas where um, the conferences were coming up. We knew that Chuck and his entourage were gonna be moving to, we're going to Seattle the first week of uh, September in order to be at aerospace conference. And so we wanted to make sure that that, that messaging was seen there before he arrived. And uh, so those were just some of them. We also could filter out some of the different pieces like we didn't need the food processing side of the aerospace industry. We don't need the support of the aerospace industry. We're looking at the manufacturing and related entities to determine where we were gonna market. And then on the One East Kentucky site, we built out a section. And this has now been expanded into a, a tire aerospace microsite, but this for the time was a couple pages that were on their page, uh, on their current website, um, that validated why there was an aerospace cluster there, including uh, the maps, the interactive maps showing where all the, the businesses were. And then beyond putting the seven reasons why aerospace companies are considering Eastern Kentucky article onto here, we had what we call support articles. So we had our anchor article, which is the big one we were sponsoring, and the support articles were other things that tied in about why Kentucky was a good thing for aerospace. So if somebody does like the article and comes back to the site, they find more articles that are in support of it. We also use those to publish with the, the following weeks to put them out there so that they linked back to our main anchor article. So that, you know, especially with rural communities, you might not have a lot of success stories. And so when you write a really good one, um, it doesn't really work just to post the same one over and over and over again. And you might not have another really good one um, every single month. And so uh, one way to kind of keep that big one alive is you put out your anchor article and then have smaller articles that might reference a part of the large article and then link back to it so that people can go find it. It gets a little more bang for its buck. Now, once we ran this campaign for a week, um, at the, at the bottom, the organic reach uh, using Chuck's network, there was uh, 1,369 impressions, 18 clicks, 23 actions. That's almost a 3% engagement, which is stunning for uh, LinkedIn. And for the sponsored reach, uh, we had 11,688 impressions, uh, 133 clicks, a fair amount of social actions, followers that joined the One East Kentucky site, and the engagement was at 1.3%. If you can get your engagement over 1%, you're doing well. But more importantly than just the stats 
and the percentages. It's, it's that we actually know that the people that were clicking on these article mattered. Uh, we know that they were from aerospace and companies. And so uh, Boeing was 699 of the impressions that saw it and seven of the people from Boeing clicked and read that article. But we know that the, the US Air Force was active and then five people from there read the article. Um, we also can determine that 75 of the clicks were from aviation aerospace, 38 of them were from defense and space, uh, et cetera. We also know the size of the companies, so that companies with 10,000 plus employees included 66 of the clicks that read that article. And we also know where they're from. As noted before, we only targeted this into very specific areas. And so we could see which of those areas were the most active. We had a lot of uh, activity from the LA area. And we did get some clicks up in the Washington, uh, or the greater Seattle area, and also DC, et cetera. So, uh, validate the, the efforts that we were doing. Most importantly, perhaps we know the roles of the people that clicked on it. So 78 of those clicks were senior management. Um, and in the case, four of the clicks were from owners of aerospace companies. Um, it might be operations managers, presidents, owners. You can see the different job titles and seniorities. All of this validated the work that we were doing and making sure that this message was getting sent directly to the people that needed to see it. Uh, LinkedIn recognized us uh, for this campaign that we did with uh, One East Kentucky and uh, put it in their October newsletter last year, which was great. Um, we worked with them closely. We partnered with LinkedIn and, and talked to them often about our strategies and get advice and, and input from them directly. And then something else happened. So they got another win. And this first article launched in September. And as of December, there was a new announcement coming out that Enerblue, a battery maker, uh, was going to be uh, moving into the Eastern Kentucky. And huge deal, huge win, super exciting. Um, so one thing that we did, uh, even though the arguably the timing of mid-December is off a little bit, that's when the announcement happened, we also sent it out through the same LinkedIn channels and networks that we did with the previous one, because we already had that campaign set up. We wanted to make sure that those people saw uh, that this uh, the success was expanding. But the most exciting thing that happened with this is we also took a video. In this case, note that this video is seven minutes long, six minutes and 54 seconds. And we put it on the Facebook page. This didn't cost anything. Um, it provided this video. And all it was was that, hey, Interblue's coming to East Kentucky, and we're really excited. What's important to note here on this is the number of people it reached, first of all, 248,568 people on Facebook uh, saw this. 129,000 people watched this. There was 2,248 shares where people shared this video uh, with their own networks. And there was over 1,000 comments. And if you want to guess what the comments were, in almost 99% of those comments, it was somebody else's name. Uh, One East Kentucky has a lot of unemployed co-workers from the mines out there that have been closing. They had almost 10,000 people. And due to this campaign, what this ended up being was a workforce awareness campaign to make them aware that this new business was coming into town. And of the thousand some comments, each time somebody put someone else's name on it, recommending that they consider applying for this job, uh, that went onto their wall, and then their friends saw it, and they shared it, and et cetera, et cetera. And it was one of the first viral economic development uh, campaigns that we've seen happen. And so um, I think of note, some of the things that uh, caught us by surprise, because even us, we were learning as we go along too, and the fact that the video length wasn't the deciding factor. It was a seven minute long video, which is, you know, in some cases, I'd say long for social media. Uh, but that didn't affect the number of uh, views. And also, um, once again, this didn't cost anything. Well, once the video was made, they were just put it on their website and it took off from there. So now that we've talked about how to get the story out, um, we talked about how do you 
convert those stories and that marketing ultimately into leads. And um, on one hand, we can validate the, the marketing effort through Google Analytics. You can see how many people are reading the stories, which is great, and um, where they're leaving and what the bounce rate is and the amount of traffic, but it doesn't really help in, in nurturing those leads. And so we use a couple of different tools. One of them is a uh, lead tracking. We have a partnership with Lead Forensics and built a portal for economic development for um, basically attracts who the companies are that are actually visiting the site and what pages they're looking at and how often. So in this case, um, uh, like I could see that the International Economic Development Council came to visit. Um, I know that they came eight different times. This last time they looked at eight pages, they spent 32 minutes on it. And it, I can go all the way in to see what specific pages they're looking at and uh, how much time they're spending on them. Now, this gets a little bit creepy because in economic development, um, site selection is more or less an anonymous industry. So this isn't the type of thing where you pick up the phone and call a company that's visiting your site because they had just read your article and were checking out your aerospace page. But it is something that A, could show you that the, the marketing you're doing is hitting the right audiences. It's also a way to look at it as the marketing, um, that, or the audiences that are coming, you could might set up meetings with them down the road, uh, perhaps at the next industry conference. Uh, perhaps it's also a way to um, know which organizations are at least interested, and then you can focus on the next level, which is lead conversion. And uh, we use HubSpot um, for our focusing for lead conversion, we call it lead nurturing. And uh, with inbound marketing is what it's, I guess as they put it, is it's the marketing that you do to the people or organizations that have already been to your website and have shown interest. So. Before they read your story, um, they were strangers. You had never seen them before. And now they've been to your site. Now you know that this particular uh, company is on your site and they're interested in, say, aerospace. Now that you know that, there might be other information regarding aerospace that they'd also be interested in. Um, in economic development, it takes sometimes many years for these deals to come to fruition, uh, but you still want to keep your community as a top of mind. And so that might be an upcoming webinar about aerospace with an interview with the CEO of one of the success stories in your region. Or perhaps it'll be a white paper about one of the success stories or an infographic that validates the, the cluster that you're uh, putting out there. And that can be additional types of content that you can pass back to the leads that have already shown interest so that now you are nurturing them. So when the time comes for a business to expand or move um, you're at top of mind and can be considered. And lastly, the last piece I'd like to share is something that we're really excited about, and I think this is going to just change the change the whole game for how we tell stories, um, and that's using virtual reality. Now, virtual reality, particularly 360 video, has a way of tricking the brain, and it does that because the uh, brain isn't used to seeing video in a sphere. If you have 360 video just for um, descriptive sake is a spherical video. So it's like standing inside a, a, a ball of video and everywhere you look, the video is playing. So if you look up or down or left and right, you see the same video and it feels like you're in it. And when your brain sees that, when your brain sees somebody walking by in a video and you're turning your head from left to right, it says, hey, you're there. And once it says you're there, it has this strong capability of creating empathy or in a way truly putting yourself in someone else's shoes. And um, this is why uh, New York Times focused on some of the Google Cardboard VR early on to try to bring awareness to um, the migrations that were happening over in Europe or the uh, what it's like to be a homeless person in New York City for a day. And to let people see what it's like to be in their shoes, and that created um, uh, more awareness of the causes. Now, this is the same thing for economic development because no one's going to move a business or the, move their families to a community that they haven't been to or felt like they've been to. And if you can't bring somebody there, especially if you're overseas at a conference, um, this is the best possible way to create the feeling of being there outside of that. 
and so we shoot these things um, with a pretty interesting camera. This is called a, a this is a GoPro Omni, and it's actually six GoPro cameras all shooting different directions in a sphere, which is funny because you can't hide behind it. So once you hit record, you have to go and hide or blend into the audience somewhere. And then once these videos are made and they're put together, they can be uh, pushed out through the websites. You can look at them through iPads and iPhones. Um, but by far the best experience is going to be using a VR headset. Uh, and uh, the one that we're most excited about, this one just came out seven weeks ago. It's called Oculus Go. It has a low price point of uh, starting at $199, but is all inclusive. So not only can you uh, have a really high quality screen to look around the videos in, it's got great 3D sound, but it's also very, very portable. This is the whole thing. You don't need any other phone. You don't need any other computer. It fits in your backpack. And uh, best of all, we can upload the 360 spherical videos right into it. So they're all ready to go. You don't even need to run them off Wi-Fi. And then telling the story, whether well, there might be a familiarization tour, telling the story about the community and, and what kind of industries have thrived there and what the people are like and why it's a great place to live. Um, what the neighborhoods are like and what the education system is like, uh, what the things are to do that are, are out in the uh, maybe the nat natural settings, whether it be mountain climbing or mountain biking or skiing, and then uh, uh, wrapping up with what the nightlife might be like, um, shopping, and some of the other, the other downtown and community might be like in the evening. So it gives a whole picture of what it's like to live there and do business there. Uh, the site tours themselves are a little bit different because they're targeted directly on a specific site. So you talk about the site, it's a little less uh, sexy in the sense that it will cover things like the wastewater treatment center, and here's the nearest the substation, and some of the other uh, uh, intersections and things that wouldn't make a good tourism video. But even with a site tour, um, a big part of that's going to be the similar type of stuff in the familiarization tour. like. Great, here's the site, but here's it's here's the site within a community. So here's the things to do, here's the neighborhoods, here's the local airport, um, and uh, here's a little bit of the quality of life. Uh, this has huge applications for workforce attraction and uh, tourism for sure. And is the way to bring your community to places, whether it be an industry show, uh, perhaps overseas, or to go work with site selectors directly where they're not at your community and be able to show them your community and career fairs and, and of course they can view them online. And sh show, I'll give you a quick example of one. This is a site tour that was made for Great River Energy. And I'm not going to play the sound through it, so there's voiceover that's going. But what I do want to show you is that even though there's some graphics on here, we're showing off a specific site that I can spin the camera around 360 degrees. I also can look all the way up and all the way down. Here's a picture of the city of St. Cloud, where this location is based in. There's some people out uh, ice skating, showing a little bit about what the quality of life is like. And what we tend to do when we're shooting these, we'll end up going back twice. So you try to get two different seasons, or sometimes you want to do the first video, but then come back for a special type of run. But you're able to, to look all around. They talk about the affordable housing, the affordable cost of living. Um, the experience of this brings storytelling to a whole nother level. And it'll be really, really exciting to see how the industry um, uses this in the future. So if you want to view more examples of that, you can check them out. They're on placevr.net, or you can access them through the Golden Shovel Agency site. Um, right now, some of the new things we've been working on up in Ohio, we're doing a project where we're incorporating 3D models that will appear inside the spherical videos so that we're truly mixing um, reality and virtual. And it'd be exciting because not only can you tell a story, but you can show visually um, 
your intentions and thoughts of uh, what might the future look like. And we unveiled this last year in Toronto at the International Economic Development Council. So this is a brand new technology. It's been exciting. It's been really well received. Uh, here's uh, Greg Wasserman's dark. He's checking out the a video that we shot up in the Duluth region of Minnesota. And when he finished watching it, he took off uh, took off the goggles. And the first thing he said was, I feel like I've been there. And for a site selection firm to feel like they've been there is certainly the goal. Um, Financial Times recognized this technology as online trends of 2018 that economic developers can't ignore and covered the uh, videos that we had been making. And I just leave it at this because really the question is, what is the future site visit going to look like? We talked about how fast things are changing in the industry. And now looking forward, um, how are we going to tell stories in this new way and bring people to our communities uh, virtually uh, in order to fulfill physically on real life economic development? So with all of that said, that was an awful lot about storytelling. I just want to say thank you. And uh, I'll just take uh, any questions that might be available. Looks like there's a, a couple different questions. Why don't I take those now? Uh, the first question is, how long should a story be considered current? Does it make sense to update stories, assuming the update is positive? And I don't think that there's necessarily um, a length of time. I mean, a good story in a community is a good story in the community for you know, for as long as it's still thriving. I mean, if it's a story of a of a business that had succeeded and no longer exists, it's probably not going to be your best uh, bet for marketing. But a uh, story is to stay current as long as that business is thriving, and absolutely, it makes sense to update them, um, especially with more of the visual pieces. If you're working with video or working with uh, uh, some of those, to be able to put in updates as as businesses expand, they build new facilities, um, and as as the technology evolves being able to keep that story alive and alive and well. So some of these stories are going to be the main stories in your community for, for a long time, and you want to um, keep them as fresh and as fresh feeling as possible. Um, another question came in. Every economic development story I see is happy, happy. Are there scenarios where it makes sense for an EDC to address questions or issues businesses may have about a community with an eye to showing what's being done to address them? I think absolutely. And, and I think that's one of the mistakes of uh, economic development uh, storytelling. Once again, if you go back to the framework that we discussed, identifying the challenge and the problem is a very important part of the story. And that part doesn't need to be happy, happy. That part should show what was at stake and how, t how rough it is. Um, in some cases, uh, part of a story might be talking about another story or another business that didn't make it. Uh, just to show how much is at stake, look, this company didn't even make it. And that might be part of what the uh, hero of your story is wrestling with. Um, so there, I think there's ways to use that. And, and also, absolutely, if there were, especially if there's a brand attached to uh, the story where it's influenced uh, uh, people's perception of your community. I don't believe it's a, uh, I think it's authentic to to focus in and, and talk about what that problem was and how it was overcome, uh, especially in the interest of influencing people's perceptions. That was a good question. Uh, another question, what kind of LinkedIn account gives you access to that level of analytics? Um, don't have to have a specialized LinkedIn account uh, to get that. What that is tied to is directly to their sponsored posts. So when you make a post and you put it on your company page, you can then choose to sponsor it. Um, or if you put it on your own page, uh, you can choose to sponsor it and put it out um, to the, the variety of based on location and a whole host of filters, um, position, title, industry, et cetera. Um, if you use the paid, um, the paid sponsorships, then you can have access to that. As far as the organic stats, I believe you have to be a first level premium member, which means you would be a paid member to it in order to get the stats on your posts. Uh, but I, I don't know that for sure. So uh, take a look. Um, and a final question came in, says, does all this new tech mean site selection visits will encompass 
many more and smaller companies? And I believe so, uh, absolutely. And we know for a fact that as many jobs, if not more, are created in each of our communities by small businesses as large companies. The difference has been where the energy and effort has been put from economic development organizations, especially with the pressures of boards and um, city councils and, and the desire to have a big win and a big announcement about a big company coming into town uh, puts a lot of the energy and efforts of the economic developers is just focusing in on those site selection consultants trying to find the large companies that are moving around. But because of the nature of the web now and with all of the access to all of this data, um, a lot of these groups, especially smaller companies, are doing their research on their own. They're expanding their own businesses. They're finding access uh, online to the these resources that were more or less hidden to small businesses back in the day. There's people didn't even know what the economic developers did in their community. And uh, some of that still exists today, but it's becoming more aware and more accessible to them. And especially with some of these uh, uh, virtual technologies and other ways for people to share their communities and particularly with the influence of these stories, uh, we will see site selection visits uh, hit a lot more smaller businesses and a lot more businesses. And another question came in, who creates these stories? And what is a typical investment in timeline? Um, so it, it depends on one hand, uh, we have, once again, all communities have these stories that are inside their communities. And so in some ways, uh, the economic development groups know who the people are that are in their communities that are thriving. So that's the beginning of that. Um, a group like ourselves, like Golden Shovel, we do a lot of content creation. So we, that's what we're using is we, we work with the community to determine what the best stories are that they're aware of and then help craft them into meaningful telling stories that uh, will resonate with the audiences we're targeting. And so um, as far as like a typical investment or a timeline, if it's a written story, um, usually a good well-crafted story working with uh, copywriters uh, might be able to be formulated within a, a month or so, especially if we're gonna have good photos uh, to set up a strategy for getting the story out, um, all of that. If it's done internally, uh, where you might just you could go around with something as simple as an iPhone camera and make interviews of people that are thriving in your communities. You can take a look at like the Yankton, South Dakota site. They have a lot of examples of different types of uh, uh, stories that they did on a very small budget and are able to do them on their own and put them up in a, a meaningful way. So there's that approach. Um, if you're going to do something like a VR video, uh, the v virtual reality videos um, tend to start at um, in our case, uh, once we get our crew and equipment out there uh, to, to go film an entire story or put together an entire video, it starts around $20,000, $25,000, and then goes down depending on the number of videos that we shoot in the region because the cost is oftentimes uh, connected to the amount of travel and getting the crew out there to, to put it all together. Well, excellent question. All right, are there... Any other questions? I don't see any more and we are uh, already five minutes over. So I say thank you to everybody that attended today. Uh, thanks for listening in on the webinar. Feel free to uh, contact us with uh, any additional questions and uh, feel free to share this webinar with others you think would benefit from it. Once again, the video will be recorded on the Golden Shovel website under the webinars page, as well as uh, we'll make the slides available uh, through SlideShare. So uh, thank you very much, everybody, and have a wonderful afternoon, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month.